Good evening and welcome to the third in our series of lectures on God and geopolitics, religion and national security in an age of instability. My name is Paul Miller. I'm the Associate Director of the Clements Center for History, Strategy, and Statecraft at the University of Texas at Austin. The Clements Center has been proud to partner with the Trinity Forum to sponsor this series of lectures. Well, last year, we heard lectures from Dr. Will M. Bowden on Reinhold Niebuhr and his record of opposing both fascism and communism and his lessons for today. We heard from Dr. Mary Habeck on jihadism and the Islamic State, how to understand the religion of jihadism. And in a few months, on May 6th, we will hear from Walter Russell Mead on God, uh, on religion and the foundations of geopolitical order. Uh, tonight, uh, in a few moments, I'll invite Cherie up to invite our speaker for tonight. Before she does, I want to make a confession in front of a room full of people uh, that for many years I have secretly been in the fan club of Dr. James Turner Johnson. Now, he doesn't know this. Uh, I ran across some of his writings years ago in an article in First Things. It was a piece, I think, entitled Just War Then and Now, Just War as it was and as it is. And it traced the evolution of the idea of just war over the centuries and pointed out how the, the idea of just war has changed, the content of the theory has changed. And at the time, I was serving in the Army. And this really struck a deep chord with me. It was um, very helpful to me in my thinking, both personally and professionally, about uh, how to think about the justice of what I was doing in my life. So I looked uh, at more of his writings. Uh, I became a fan of what he, was, uh, what he was doing and how he was arguing. So for many years, I've been working for uh, just this sort of event tonight. Uh, so thank you to the Trinity Forum for helping uh, this come, come about. So to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Cherie Harder, the president of the Trinity Forum. Thank you, Paul. It's been a real pleasure for all of us at the Trinity Forum to get to work with the Clement Center, with Will Inbone, with Paul Miller. So we're really just delighted by the partnership. Thank you. As Paul mentioned, this is the third in a series of four different evening conversations that we're doing on the topic of God and geopolitics, religion and national security in an era of instability. And our hope for this series is to provide a forum to explore and discuss the relationship between faith and foreign policy and the ways in which theology affects geopolitical reality. So we're delighted that each of you are here tonight on a cold, chilly, soggy, and street um, blocked evening. It was a, a real challenge to get here, so we appreciate the hardy souls who push through. Um, if you have friends who wanted to be here but were not, could not make it, or caught up by the, the roads, the blockages, whatever it is, we will be recording tonight's event, which you can see on our website at www.ttf.org. Uh, they're also welcome to offer their comments, thoughts, questions, and the like, either on our Facebook page or on our Twitter feed at hashtag Trinity Forum. For those of you who this is their first time and are not familiar with the Trinity Forum, we work to provide a space and resources for leaders to engage life's greatest questions in the context of faith. And we do this by providing readings and publications which draw upon classic works of literature to connect timeless wisdom of the humanities with timely issues and sponsoring programs like this one tonight to connect leading thinkers with thinking leaders in engaging life's biggest questions and ultimately to come to better know the author of the answers. We also hold Socratic forums around the world to enable and equip leaders to grapple with those questions, to live and lead more wisely, and to connect history and the humanities with the here and now and the timeless truths with the issues of the day. And certainly one of the great questions of all time is how to rightly understand, confront, and thwart those who seek the harm or even the destruction of our society. When and how is the use of coercive power and deadly force just? How do we understand and respond to threats in a manner both restrained and effective? How do we safeguard our nation's security without sacrificing our ideals and protect our citizens without corrupting our soldiers? And how should we understand and engage a new enemy 
that actually revels in atrocity and exploits great evil as a form of recruitment? Certainly not easy questions, and there are no easy answers. But there are a few who can engage them with the historical expertise, the scholarly acumen, or the insight than our speaker tonight, Dr. James Turner Johnson. Dr. Johnson is distinguished professor of religion and a member of the Graduate Department of Political Science at Rutgers University, where he has been on the faculty since 1969. He's been called the foremost scholar of the just war tr tradition working today with decades of research and training focused on the historical development and application of moral traditions related to war, peace, and the practice of statecraft. His numerous academic awards include Rockefeller, Guggenheim, and National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowships and Research Grants, and he served as a trustee and general editor of the Journal of Religious Ethics, as well as co-editor of the Journal of Military Ethics. A staggeringly prolific author, his many books include, but are certainly not limited to, Ethics and the Use of Force, Just War and Historical Perspective, The War to Oust Saddam Hussein, and Morality and Contemporary Warfare. Responding to Dr. Johnson will be General Josiah Bunting, a soldier, strategist, scholar, and teacher who can provide perspective on grappling with military ethics not only under pressure, but even under fire. Bunting is the president of the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation in New York City, and previously served as the superintendent of the Virginia Military Institute, his alma mater. After graduating from VMI and serving in the Army, Bunting studied at, at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, subsequently serving in the 9th Infantry Division at Vietnam as a history professor at West Point, and upon completion of his military service, as professor of strategy at the Naval War College. Before returning to VMI, he also serves as the president of Hampton Sydney College and is headmaster of the Lawrenceville School in New Jersey. He serves on the boards of the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Revolution Center, and the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and in his spare time has written biographies of both Ulysses S. Grant and George Marshall. We'll hear from Do General Bunting right after Dr. Johnson speaks. Dr. Johnson, welcome. Well, hello, everybody. I, I want to add my uh, gratitude to you for coming out on this very nasty day, uh, and especially since I'm sure some of you have had very long days before this. So thank you for extending your time here in downtown Washington for this. I've been asked to talk about the just war idea and the contemporary security environment in the context of this ongoing series on religion and national security. This means we need to come to terms with how best to think of all of these, the just war idea, national security, and the relationship of religion to both. I'll do this from within the frame of the just war idea. I think the first thing to say about this is to observe how important the just war idea has become in recent decades as a focus for moral reflection about the use of military force. Just war is treated in courses in all the American service academies and the war colleges, as well as in their counterparts and NATO allies, including the UK, Norway, and the Netherlands. It's also a subject treated in both undergraduate and graduate courses in several disciplines at civilian colleges and universities all across the, this country and in those other countries I mentioned. In academic writing, it's become a particularly hot topic for philosophers. It's regularly discussed in one or more sessions of the annual meetings of the International Studies Association and has been the, the subject of a steady stream of books. The growth and spread of just war thinking has, though, brought an important negative result. There's a great deal of disagreement over exactly what the just war idea is, how to use it, 
and what its implications are for the contemporary use of armed force. In this contested debate, there are four conceptions of just war that are especially important. One is the conception that I will start with, um, which is what I call the classic idea of just war. This understanding came together over roughly a century in the late 12th and 13th centuries and then held sway for about 500 years in all until the end of the Reformation era. This conception was Christian in the sense that it took shape in canon law and in Christian theology and was transmitted largely by people in this field, those fields. But those people understood the just war idea that they defined as rooted in natural law, not revelation, that is in common moral sensibility, and as having to do with the responsibilities of temporal government as over against the spiritual sphere where the church had sway. Many of the same persons who contributed to bringing together and defining this early understanding of just war were also involved in recovering and applying Roman law, especially its conceptions of jus gentium, or the law of nations, and jus naturale, or the law or natural law. Further, the canonists and the theologians of this period came almost entirely from the knightly class. And so as a group, they had close relatives who were involved in government and in warfare. The idea of just war which these people shaped thus reflected theoretical and practical influences from all these endeavors. And the result was a conception that represented the broad cultural consensus that I referred to earlier. Though it was three generations of canonists who first pulled together this idea of just war, most people know it through the succinct summary provided by Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologiae in the latter part of the 13th century. In his question on war, Aquinas identified three requirements for a just war. The authority of a prince, a just cause, and a right intention. The first of these meant the authority of a temporal ruler with no temporal superior, a conception the canonists use to deny the right of resort to force, on the one hand, to church authorities, which was not a small accomplishment in the era of the early Crusades, but second, to members of the nobility as well as ordinary people who were not at the top of the hierarchy of decision making. The word Aquinas used, the Latin princeps, or prince, was being rendered in French and English by this time by a new word, souverain or sovereign. And so we can responsibly recognize the first requirement of a just war that Aquinas listed as sovereign authority. Sovereign here was defined as a personal moral responsibility, a rather different conception from the idea of sovereignty as territorial and viability, which has taken over in the modern period. Sovereignty as personal moral responsibility of the ruler for the common good, then, is the core concept here. It's the sovereign who has to decide whether there has been a violation of justice and how to remedy it, and whether that remedy can include the use of armed force. It's further the sovereign who has to decide how to use that force so as to satisfy the reconstitution of justice and society that will produce general peace. And that's the basic idea of the classic conception of just war. On the on this matter of dealing with violations of justice. The use of armed force might be necessary for the sake of justice. And so the sovereign had the responsibility for determining when justice had been violated 
and the proper means for rectifying it and punishing the wrongdoer. The need to do so was, in fact, the definition of just cause the canonists agreed upon, and Aquinas included this in his summary account of just war. And then there was the matter of right intention, which included the end of peace, but also included a listing of a number of wrong intentions that ultimately came out of, out of uh, St. Augustine's writings, and these, in turn, fed into the developing notion of right conduct in war, which was already w well uh, in place within the canon law, but which Aquinas didn't treat in that section of his because he was concerned with the resort to force. Anticipating uh, what I'm going to be saying a little bit later, this whole conception is very different from what one finds in, I think, far too much contemporary thinking that masquerades as just war thinking, which is actually about trying to avoid any use of force whatsoever. The medievals and the early modern people understood well that sometimes this may be the only way to deal with injustice and the people who bring it about. At any rate, I said this lasted for about 500 years as a cultural consensus in the West. What happened to stop that? And the short answer is, actually a long answer, uh, the advent of modernity. The cultural consensus broke apart as European society broke apart under the stresses of the modern age. And as we look going forward from roughly the 16th century, we find that the philosophers took up part of it and became fascinated with the idea of abolishing war through creation of an international order that would ensure a perpetual peace. The international lawyers took up part of it and turned it into the idea of the law of nations. Another por portion of it was taken up and kept intact within the military sphere and became the laws and customs of war. Religion largely lost sight of it. And over the next centuries, for a time, there was a flirtation with holy war in part of the 19th century, but there was more generally a drift towards pacifism, which really took over, especially in the Protestant churches, in the early 20th century. I want to say one last thing about this classic conception of just war. It wasn't a standalone idea. It was rooted directly in a conception of politics and the good or ends of politics, which following the classical heritage were defined in terms of order, justice, and peace. So the just war idea defined in terms of sovereign authority, just cause, and the end of peace corresponded directly to these political goods, these goods of good politics. And I think that the fact that, that uh, the just war idea was tied into a general political understanding is something that is very important for why it was a success and why it deserves looking at closely even from the perspective of several centuries later on. I was talking about how the just war idea divided up into its various parts and the various streams uh, that carried it during the modern period all led in their own particular directions. I mentioned how in the religious sphere uh, it was largely forgotten for some 350 years as the churches drifted more and more in the direction of pacifism. By the time that the nuclear debate came along in the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s, there were essentially two options for talking about morality and warfare. One was pacifism, which said no to all war as being inherently evil, and the other was provided by Reinhold Niebuhr's comment that while war is evil, sometimes it is a necessary evil. 
Now, neither of these really said much about any positive thing that's coming out of war, and neither of them offered any leverage on right conduct in war. All of that began to change when, in the early 1960s, the Christian ethicist Paul Ramsey published first one book and then another applying to, aimed at recovering and applying the idea of just war. And this is the second of the four streams that I uh, mentioned earlier. The classic conception was the first, Ramsey's conception was the second, and there's still a tradition coming out of him, and then later on I'll talk about the other two. The context of Ramsey's writing was the debates of the period over nuclear weapons, deterrence, and the possibility of nuclear war. At the time, Christian moral reflection on these matters was polarized between various forms of pacifism, which rejected war and preparation for war as evil in themselves, and Reinhold Niebuhr's Christian realism, which also understood war as evil, but admitted that sometimes it's a necessary evil. Neither of these positions could say anything at all about the possible moral conduct of war. For pacifism, all war is evil, and that's the end of the matter. For Christian realism, on Niebuhr's view, it remains evil, but when it's necessary, the question of restraint boils down simply to the judgment of whatever is needed to defeat the enemy. Ramsey stepped into the gap between these two positions with a Christian moral conception of just war based in Jesus' teaching that Christians should love their neighbors as themselves. Love of neighbor, Ramsey argued, implies that, Christ, that, that the Christian should seek to protect any neighbor from being harmed wrongly by another. This gave Christians permission to use violent force if this was necessary for, for such protection and indeed in some cases, it even obligated them to do so. But, Ramsey went on, love of neighbor also implies limiting what is done to the attacker, for that person, too, is a neighbor that one is commanded to love. Ramsey used a reading of Augustine, the one that was then in vogue among Protestant theologians, to ground this argument, though what he cited from Augustine's thought was entirely different from what had been used in the framing of the classic just war idea, a fact that I have found very interesting, but I won't talk about that. I'm only talking about the uninteresting things. You know. <laughs> Set against Christian pacifism, Ramsey's focus on love provided a powerful argument that force could and sometimes should be used in the interests of love. Set against Christian realism, it provided systematic guidance for thinking through a nation's rights in the use of armed force and what restraints it should follow. Ramsey used this latter line of thinking to enter the debate among civilian strategists and policy professionals over nuclear deterrence, which was then going on, and the possible use of nuclear weapons in war. He's had a good deal of influence in Christian theological circles, and I, mentioned, I, I, I would mention uh, one figure in particular, Nigel Bigger of Oxford University, who recently published an excellent book that's very much in the Ramsian tradition. Jean Betke Elstein also, uh, in many ways, uh, drew, drew her understanding of just war out of Ramsey. While Ramsey repeatedly insisted in his writing that the idea of just war is a theory of politics, he never explained exactly what he meant by this. The conception of just war, his conception of just war, focused on two moral principles defining right conduct in the use of military force. Discrimination, that is not directly and intentionally targeting non-combatants, and proportionality. He said very little about the initiation of war, saying that this question belongs to the sphere of statecraft, and that he, as a moralist, had no expertise or standing there. That modesty has not always been copied by other writers on just war. I think that this was well said as far as it goes. 
but I also believe that as a moralist, he could have and should have said a bit more about the responsibilities of statecraft, its limits, and how this pertains to the matter of the use of military force. But another shortcoming of Ramsey's approach, as rooted in the idea of Christian love, is that powerful as it is within the Christian context, there's no good reason why any non-Christian should pay any attention to it. And so it is limited as a guide for thinking about issues of statecraft and particularly of national security, our, our subject tonight. Roughly a decade after Ramsey in 1977, Michael Walzer's Just and Unjust Wars appeared. This was the second major step in the rebirth of the just war idea. Although, as I suggested for Ramsey, it was not so much a recovery, it was a recovery of the term, but not a recovery of the idea. It was a reinvention of the idea. Walzer described his purpose with this sentence. I want to recapture the just war for political and moral theory. Like Ramsey, he made no use of the earlier classic tradition of just war, in his case, insisting that he wanted to address the problem of, problem of war in only contemporary terms. Like Ramsey then, but in a different way, Walzer's work wasn't actually a recovery of the just war idea, but a reinvention of it. In Walzer's case, that meant, this meant moving from three bases, what he called the war convention, by which he meant what then current international law had to say about war, second, human rights, and third, a subtle use of historical cases throughout the book, which served to introduce particular moral ideas and argue that they reflect common human moral intuitions. Walser's book was written and appeared in the context of the debate over the Vietnam War, and it raised issues that immediately applied to that war, and looking backwards, to World War II as well. By contrast to Ramsey, whose basic methodology was specifically Christian, Walzer's was designedly secular, and both immediately and since, his and since his conception of just war has produced a large reaction. Today, his contribution is particularly important for philosophical thinking about war. The philosophers tend to look no further than Walzer, for a definition of just war, forgetting anything else that's out there. But the typical philosophical use of Walzer is not to try to treat him as a whole or follow through the uh, thrust of his thinking, but rather to take one or another idea from his thought on just war and then develop it to the personal ends of whichever philosopher is writing about it. Consider examples provided by two prominent contemporary philosophers known for their writing on just war. David Roden of Oxford constructs his own moral theory of war based on human rights, building on Walzer's use of human rights. To argue that, but he then goes on to argue that war can be just only if there is under if, if it is under the authority of an effective system of international government. Lacking that, there can be no just wars. There's no room for states to use armed force, whatever the reason on this conception. Now, Walzer never said anything like this. A second example is my Rutgers colleague in philosophy, Jeff McMahon, who takes from Walzer the idea of the moral equality of soldiers. Now, Walzer defended this idea, and it's a bedrock element in international humanitarian law. McMahon, though, argues that, contrary to Walzer and the law, the moral status of soldiers is different according to whether their cause is just or unjust. Fighting in a just cause gives a soldier the right to kill enemies who are fighting in an unjust cause, but the latter have no moral right to fight or kill. In the real world of political relations and interactions, such moral clarity is difficult or impossible to come by. 
This is the reason for the doctrine of the moral equality of soldiers in the first place. Of course, every belligerent deems his own cause just. And if that means that those on the other side must be entirely unjust, inhuman for practical purposes, then every war must become one of indiscriminate slaughter. The behavior of the Islamic State comes to mind, convinced entirely of their own justice and righteousness, everyone else is the enemy, including even other Muslims that don't agree with them. Walzer himself has a low opinion of much philosophical argumentation, describing it as not really about war at all, but really about debates among the philosophers. I tend to agree with this and would add that there's no guidance to be found in such work as the ones that I've mentioned for thinking in just war terms about national and international security. So let me turn to the third major pillar of the rebirth of the just war idea, which also has produced its own subsequent stream of just war thought, which is part of this current debate. This is the 1983 pastoral letter of the US Catholic bishops, The Challenge of Peace. While the bishops could certainly have recovered the classic conception of just war, since it was there in Aquinas after all, and since a summary version of it had remained in Catholic canon law well into the 20th century, they didn't take any note of any, either of these. Rather, the, 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 uh, the pastoral defined yet a third new conception of just war, this one strongly reflecting the influence of the pacifist wing of the Conference of Bishops and a vocal activist anti-war segment of the Catholic laity. Arguing that the basic Christian position is a presumption against war, the bishops then define the just war idea by listing a number of criteria that must be met, all of them, in any particular case in order that this presumption could be overridden. If any one of them were not met, then that means the presumption remained and war could not be initiated. Their list included the criteria of just cause and what they termed competent authority, not sovereign, though they reversed the order from the classic listing, putting just cause first. This has always bothered me because it raises the question of who gets to decide whether there is a just cause. And I sneakily suspect that maybe the bishops had themselves in mind here. At any rate, uh, the competent authority here is simply the one who has the authority to act if the other criteria are all satisfied. The structure of the bishop's argument is that the, uh, the moralists and maybe the bishops themselves and not those involved in the actual governing of the state get to make the call. And I find this to be very troublesome because we elect our governors, our, our rulers, to be able to do exactly that. They are our agents and I don't think they ought to forget that and I don't think we ought to forget that. One final thing about this, about this listing that the bishops provided, the end of peace does not appear in their list of criteria. And I've always suspected, although I've never been able to get a straight answer on this, that this is because peace had come to, me, to mean, in this context, simply the absence of war, not a state of just political order that might be reached through the right exercise of armed force to correct violations of justice. In practice, since the 1983 pastoral was written, spokesmen for the bishops <clears throat> who have used this conception of just war have issued statements on the bishops' behalf during critical later debates, and they have focused on several newly added prudential criteria, not the ones that are in the classic listing, judging in all these cases that these prudential criteria had not been satisfied, and so the use of force in question would be unjust. One persistent critic of the US Catholic bishops on war, 
has called their position a functional pacifism because of this persistent line of argument. If no case in practice can ever meet the bishop's prudential tests for overruling the presumption against war, how then does one think about national and international security and peace on the basis of this conception? All these concerns, I would suggest, present us again with the historical classic understanding of just war and argue for giving it a closer look. In my own work, I've argued that rather than the, re the reinventions of the just war idea that have dominated recent just war thinking, anybody seriously interested in the idea of just war and contemporary uses of armed force should pay close attention to this earlier classic tradition. Let me highlight three things about this classic idea of just war that differentiate it from these other three contemporary strands of just war thinking, and in my judgment, make it better. First, it had to do with a conception of justice understood as common to all humanity, regardless of other differences, and acting so as to defend this justice. Thus, in principle, <clears throat> it reached and still reaches not to common moral, or reaches out to, I'm sorry, sort of blew that one. Uh, it reached out and it reaches out to common moral sensibilities and prods us to seek to find those in every instance and try to satisfy them. Further, there's no presumption against war to be found in classic just war thinking. Whether the use of force is good or bad depends on its purpose. Does it serve the proper needs of life, the goods of life in political community? The classics would call it order, justice, and peace. Today, we would use the language of national security, international security, and personal security for this. Does it serve these needs or not? Violence as such is not the moral problem here, but various forms of injustice, and particularly those forms which seriously disrupt good public order and brings an end to peaceful endeavors and peaceful relationships. Because of this, the idea of just war also imposes restraints on the use of armed force in the service of justice. And then third, we should take very seriously the priority of sovereign authority in the classic conception of just war. This wasn't accidental. The classic traditional understanding of just war placed a high value on good government. It begins with the responsibilities of government to secure the common good of the society, first of those governed and then more broadly of the community of societies whose mutual just order and peace make for just order and peace in every individual political community. Today, again, we call this security, personal security, national security, and international security. All these features that I've mentioned of the classic conception of just war bear directly on the question of security. Security on this conception is not just about defense against potential or actual threats, though it certainly includes that. But the provision, rather it is about the provision of a social order and a political order that seek to, minima to minimize injustice, to maximize justice, and to maximize peaceful stability that allows for everyone to reach his or her own individual good and for the society as a whole to prosper. The role of religion here is to pull all this together within a coherent moral frame. Ultimately, the classic conception of just war reminds us that the use of armed force must always be in the service of good statecraft and that it is the obligation of government to seek to achieve its proper ends. That's what the just war idea is about. Thank you.
Thank you, Doctor. It would have to be uh, a much colder and nastier night than tonight uh, to keep me from listening to that wonderful address that you just gave us. I'm deeply appreciative. My background is not scholarly or academic. <clears throat> I worked in a number of professions. I am interested always in the value of education, no matter what the profession may be. But in particular, I am concerned with the issues that you raised this evening and with the attitude of the American Academy the American University, broadly speaking, towards the earnest study of those issues. For example, uh, military history, which occupies the lowest caste on most university campuses, right down there with speech and home ec. <laughs> A generation uh, of American academics, most of them now in their 60s, who in the 60s and early 70s uh, took, as they say in England, took almost violently against war of any kind, however necessary it might be. And their position has not significantly changed. So that uh, those universities which we esteem of the highest uh, caste in our country, many of them uh, on the coasts, fail to seriously attend uh, to the issues that we have just heard explored. You would think the fury <clears throat> of area bombardment would rouse God to relent. The infinite spaces are still silent. He stares on shock-pride faces. Heaven even does not know what is meant. You would think that after so many centuries, God would give man to repent, yet he can kill as Cain could, no farther advanced than in his ancient furies. Was man made stupid not to see his own stupidity? Is the eternal truth man's fighting soul, wherein the beast ravens in his own avidity? Of Averill, I speak, and Wettering, names on a list in officers' school, whose faces I do not recall, but they are gone to early death, who late in life distinguished the belt feed lever from the belt holding fall. One view of war. What about this Hamlet wandering across? what is called a field, in the company of his keepers, Rosenstern and Gildenkrantz, sees an army in the distance and asks his keepers to ascertain who it is and what its purpose is. They return and say, that is young Fortinbras of Norway. He goes to fight the Polak, first use of that demotic that I know of. In Hamlet, uh, thinking for a moment, as he always pauses, and we know something important is coming. To his shame, he sees the imminent death of 20,000 men, that for a fantasy and a trick of fame, go to their graves like beds, fight for a plot which is not tomb enough and continent to hide the slain. They're fighting over a piece of land, straightening out a border that won't be big enough for a cemetery. Or consider this, and I'm quoting uh, two people separated by 2,500 years. Ambassadors from the city-state of Corinth have been asked to address the Spartan assembly. And in one of their deathless and most memorable lines, they conclude by saying, you have not yet begun to consider what sorts of people are these Athenians whom you may have to fight. An admonition repeated almost verbatim by a man we can uh, 
scarcely expect would have read Thucydides, although perhaps he did because he attended Harvard for a year and a half, Isakuro Yamamoto, the Japanese naval genius who constructed the idea of an implementation of Pearl Harbor. He told his superiors in the liaison conference, we can triumph over six months, but after that, we have no idea what we will be up against. Now, the point I'm trying to make with these discombobulated shards of history and the literature is that people go to war, they fight, almost invariably on the basis of limited knowledge, rage, anger. And as we just heard in our wonderful opening address, the remedy for practical people is what we call statecraft, statecraft. When I was an undergraduate at my uh, English alma mater, the highest word of praise one heard was the adjective thoughtful. What is Smith like? What is Jones like? He's a very thoughtful person. During the late 1930s, and certainly through 1950, perhaps a bit later, the United States was governed and its military forces commanded by an extraordinary generation of thoughtful, brave, wise people. Most of them, incidentally, had the kind of wisdom uh, that we find at that intersection of brains and what is called character. The kind of wisdom that says, wait a second, have you considered so and so? Uh, the kind of wisdom that we call and salute with the word disinterested, objective. Paul Johnson calls that the great, greatest generation. He's thinking particularly of the immediate post-war period in American history and governance since the founding. And I would suggest uh, before I sit, uh, sit down that all of us as professional or amateur historians deserve to look very seriously at that generation. These are Americans born roughly between 1875 and 1910 that generation, how were they educated? How were they prepared? How did they think about these timeless issues? And more importantly, when we talk about learning from history, where did they get the characterological wherewithal to implement what they had learned from history? As a final comment before I sit down, they came, the civilians and military tribunes of that great generation, from two uh, rather discreet uh, sources. From little towns and farms in what we sometimes on the East Coast call the American outback, Abilene, Kansas, Morbilly, Missouri, Fredericksburg, Texas, those kinds of places, Ike being the classic example, or part of a cohort which was educated in a privileged way in schools in the American Northeast, schools and colleges, in which the ethos of public service was drummed into them, and they embraced it. And they embraced it uh, thoughtfully and bravely and they embodied a quality which has almost fled completely from American life. And that is why people like Stephen Ambrose and others who have celebrated the Second World War credit them with acting as champions unknowingly of an enduring value of character, which in our case we have not got. Modesty. Marshall, George Marshall, a undoubtedly great man, a tribute of this group, as to write his memoirs, refused on the grounds, quote, I have already been adequately compensated by my country. Besides, were I to do this earnestly and seriously, I might give pain to the families of men no longer living who have deserved well of our country. So I suggest that as a practical matter in history, that we look very seriously at how such people, such tribunes, such 
practitioners of statecraft were themselves educated and raised. Let me conclude with full disclosure. Uh, I enjoy the title of general. I found it helps get a good table in certain parts of the United States. <laughs> but my title was what is called a local title. It was given me by the authorities at the Virginia Military Institute uh, who hired me to do something which I did not favor, namely to preside over the admission of women. And I was given that title, and once in a while I get a kick out of hearing it. But I am no more a general than, than the man in the moon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, let's go there. For the next 20 minutes or so, we will have what's often the most interesting part of any evening conversation, and that's the conversation part of it. So this is the time when we take questions from the audience. And of course, there's just there's three basic rules to the Q&A time. We simply ask that questions be brief, civil, and in the form of a question. So there'll be two uh, microphones on either side. Please wait till the microphone actually gets to you. Uh, and simply we'll recognize you here and you can direct your question to either uh, Josiah Bunting or Dr. Johnson, wh whoever you pick, or to both. Any questions for our speakers? Mm -hmm. Keith, in the back. Hi. Uh, I guess this question is for uh, either or both of you. Um, I'm thinking about the current ideological battles that we're facing with what's going on in the Middle East right now that the U.S., the United States, and the West are facing against um, ISIS, against Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, et cetera, and comparing it with <clears throat> past ideological battles that, that the U.S. and West have faced. In particular, I guess I'm thinking about the Cold War, where we look now, I guess, at our point in the 21st century as the Cold War as <clears throat> being something that started after World War II, lasted for 45 years or so, and now it's something in the history books. Um, Going forward, I guess I'm wondering your perspective on the current it, things going on in the battles going on in the Middle East, if the battles that, ideological battles that the West and the U.S. are facing against Islamists are going to be something that lasts for another 10, 15, 20 years, or is this something that the West is going to be facing and battling for the next 50, 100, 200 years? Well, my own view is that we're in a new age uh, as regards warfare. There, there is, uh, as always among political scientists and philosophers, there, there is a, a, a new war theory, NWT as it's called, that uh, talks about this. But I think you just have to look around and you see that the, the kinds of wars that are being carried on now are very different from the kinds of wars that uh, for, many, uh, for many people still define the idea of war, World War II, World War I perhaps, or maybe the Civil War if they look far enough behind. But I, I think that if you, if you want to understand this kind of war, you, it would help to, to use a, a deeper historical perspective. Uh, I, am, I am convinced that the Islamic State thinks of itself in holy war terms. And we in the West are very uncomfortable with this whole idea. And particularly, I think, many of our policy elites are extremely uncomfortable with it. Uh, going back to the Peace of Westphalia, which ended the last of the great religious wars of the Reformation, the idea was that finally a way had been found <clears throat> not ever to fight over religion anymore, but then even though we weren't fighting over religion in World War II, we were fighting over ideology, which functionally was very much the same way. And now the Islamic State defines its core purpose in quintessentially religious terms, borrowed and I think distorted from Islamic tradition. But it's something that needs to be met in our thinking on its own terms. And Frankly, we are just trying to figure out now how to do it after several hundred years of, of not confronting warfare of such sort. 
and I don't think we're doing very well at it thus far. John. The, uh, the concept of the nation state is a Western and arguably at least a, a Christian tradition. Um, my question is how in a world of multipolarity can we try to advocate for what is best in the classical Christian tradition to, of, of, of just war to other religions, other, other sources of authority? I'm speaking not just of Islam, but of Hinduism, Confucianism, and obviously secularism. Well, I've, I've done some comparative work. Uh, I've, I've, I've focused on comparing the Western tradition with that of Islam. But I've recently gotten interested also because some friends of mine have, have been working on this uh, in the uh, ethical traditions on warfare and politics in China, in Chinese history. There are very important traditions, both in the Islamic world and in the Chinese world, uh, that uh, in many ways parallel and in many ways uh, mirror the, uh, the kind of conception that I was talking about as the classic idea of just war. They emphasize the importance of, of responsible governance, of, of the moral responsibility of, of the person who is charged with that governance. They uh, emphasize the importance of establishing a just social order in which individuals can be at peace with one another and bring about their own prosperity. Uh, there is a, a, a somewhat uh, less developed tradition in the, in, in the Indian world uh, that goes back ultimately to the Bhagavad Gita. But, but in, the, uh, in the, the case of, of China and the case of, uh, of, the, of the Islamic world, we have real parallels uh, with the idea of just war. And uh, like uh, that, that prescient figure, Sam Huntington, I think that it would behoove us to understand these better and to urge them to try to understand us better. And I think uh, a major staple of learning to understand them better uh, is the inculcation of the habit of uh, curiosity, intellectual curiosity, later on academic curiosity, uh, in the very young, 13, 14, 15, uh, not 21, 22, 23, getting in the habit of thinking seriously and uh, across a wide range of cultures and of history uh, about people who have gone before and who have faced challenges not dissimilar uh, from our own. Uh, I think in particular in my own life, uh, uh, in my own studies, I think of people like the younger Pitt of England, uh, I think of Pericles, I think of Abraham Lincoln, I think of Franklin Roosevelt, as people who are able seriously to articulate the values <coughs> for which they were prosecuting wars of which they themselves were not the authors, uh, it seems to me that the inculcation of a love of that kind of history is extremely important. And you might want to check many of you who have children of that age or perhaps even in college uh, at the curricula, curricula uh, to which they are being uh, exposed. I can think of at least one eminent New England college in which only one seminar, of, one semester of history is required and it is non-Western. <laughs> so these are, these are the kinds of things that uh, I, I think at least are practical, uh, not solutions, but practical uh, enterprises. I must say also, uh, I disbelieve in the notion of a all-volunteer military. I think every American uh, ought to have a couple of years doing some form of national service with a particular incentive to serve in the Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marines. Uh, uh, so many people uh, now are in positions to give their opinions about what we are doing and what we are asking of our military people, and they have no idea what it is we are sending them out there to do. And let me just fire for, uh, for one last target of uh, opportunity. <laughs> the last thing I heard uh, on my flight uh, home from Vietnam. Most of us uh, have only a cloudy, somewhat alcoholic memory of that, but I did hear a voice say, uh, 
quote, you gentlemen be well advised to change into civilian attire before leaving the post or the base. That's a heck of a thing to say to a bunch of kids, uh, the majority of whom are draftees. Maybe this is why we hug everybody we see in uniform in an airport now. But I do think that's, uh, that's something that we can get after. Just to kind of pick up on that, uh, you all have talked about the, you know, the higher level of, uh, of just war theory. What do we say today to the soldier, the guy flying the airplane, or even the guy who's work, working the joystick with the uh, UAV up there? Well, <clears throat> I, I think that uh, the, the, the folks that are responsible for uh, assigning the people that fly the drones uh, came to the realization somewhat later than they should have that those people need to have some training that prepares them for the decisions that they have to make and the kinds of relationships that they would inevitably forge with the people that they're watching while trying to find a target. Uh, that kind of training is effectively moral training as well as being uh, technical in its nature and psychological in its nature. And so there, there really does need to be a good deal of that. There needs to be a good deal of that, frankly, across the board. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk how the, the idea of just war has gotten into the curriculums and all the service academies and the war colleges. Uh, it doesn't seem to get down below the officer ranks, though. And that's, I think that's troubling. Uh, I think that, that there are ways of, of uh, implementing that in, in the, the training regimes of uh, even the lowest ranks, but certainly the non-coms. And, uh, and I, I would really like to see more of that. The Army has a, a program which uh, addresses uh, specifically that uh, that lack of education for uh, NCOs. Uh, I don't know if you, any of you participate in it, but we have five American universities uh, which uh, enroll, or I, I should say enlist, uh, groups of 50 or 60 uh, officers in the grade of uh, captain and major uh, and NCOs uh, E6 through uh, E9. And they, would you believe it, uh, begin by reading uh, Thucydides Clausewitz and the kinds of things that we're talking about. So I think the, I think the Army is at least making uh, early steps to, uh, to deal with that. Just Glad to hear that. Here in the second I have a question. Uh, some, a lot of what you've said so far has been sort of good versus evil, just versus not. But it strikes me in today's world, it's a, it's a choice of which lesser bad guy are we going to support? So what do you do in that case where the choice is not between arguably good or evil, the choice is between this guy is worse than that guy, but he's still a bad guy? <laughs> he's he's handing it off to me. I, I mean, that's, uh, you know, the, the, I don't think that's a question that one can answer in the abstract. I, I think that that's a matter of political judgment and that uh, uh, the, 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 the problem is that is one that anybody who is in a position of political responsibility has to has to be able to, to, to make wisely. Uh, I was talking with somebody earlier today, or, or recently anyway, about uh, uh, how, how Thomas Aquinas handled the question of tyranny. Uh, he uh, he, he didn't, didn't have anything good to say about tyrants at all, but he was also very unwilling to uh, grant people the, the right to overthrow them because of the disorder that he expected would result from that. And, and so he thought that under at least some circumstances, people would be a lot worse off if they overthrew some tyrants. So he says, well, if, if the tyranny isn't too bad, it's better just to put up with it. If it gets too bad, then uh, the person should be overthrown and neighboring rulers should, should have a hand in that as a way of maintaining the, 
the social order that's necessary for, for people's uh, prosperity. But uh, how do you decide when the tyranny is too bad? How do you decide whether this one ought to be overthrown and that one ought to be tolerated? He doesn't really tell anybody how to do that. He just says, you have to. The great uh, cosmic moral question having to do with uh, destruction and killing of enemies and those who happen to live uh, among our act active enemies uh, is the uh, long debate uh, in the White House and in the Pentagon and among committees of uh, soldiers and politicians as to how the war in Japan should be brought to an end. That's one of the uh, one of the debates that everybody should uh, look at searchingly. Uh, ultimately, it seemed to have come down to a grim uh, calculus uh, in, as to uh, which would cause uh, the least number of deaths. Uh, an issue like that uh, is something all of us should uh, wrestle with as part of our, part of our education. Uh, there is a wide and deep literature on that particular subject, as, as I'm sure most of you know. Uh, ironically, uh, if you're historians, I, I know you have read about this, uh, what the Japanese did uh, in the last two battles in the Pacific, particularly uh, Okinawa, ironically led to the decision uh, to use the, uh, use the atomic bombs. That is to say, the costs uh, to us and our allies would be so astronomical. We believed at the time of invasion that we thought this was the lesser of two evils. What a, what a hateful cliche. Sir. David. Uh, for Dr. Johnson, um, and I hope it's not just inattention after dinner, but I, I heard you mention four conceptions of just war. I got classic, I got Ramsey, and I got the bishops, but I missed some. Uh, you, you missed Michael Walzer. Walzer, I didn't realize that was. Yeah, that was, that was the second. I, uh, the, the three, I, I call them the three pillars of the recovery of the just war idea, Ramsey, Walzer, and the bishops. Uh, Ramsey dealt with it on the, on the side of Christian ethics. Walzer dealt with it in the frame of secular political philosophy. And then the bishops dealt with it in their own ecclesiastical frame, but they also uh, served the enormous uh, good of, of getting it out before the public and before the policy community, much more than, than Ramsey and Walzer were ever able to do. Go ahead. I think they're, they're wrong, though. <laughs> yes, uh, Professor, I want to hear more from the general, I guess, in response, but I was curious, he made some somewhat scathing uh, comments about the American academic situation on many levels. And I was wondering, first of all, do you agree? Uh, and if you do, do you have a solution or solutions? If you don't agree, why not? Well, I, 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 I'm not going to disagree. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, but but I, I do think that, uh, the, that it, I mean, the, the, the couple of philosophers that I, that I spoke about are, are examples of, of that kind of thinking also. But uh, I, I, I do think that there are differences uh, from one institution to another. I think there are differences from one academic discipline to another. So I, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's just a universal thing. But I, I do uh, uh, share the concern that, that, uh, that there are attitudes uh, abroad in the academic world that are fundamentally uh, critical of, of uh, what Western society is all about and what the United States is all about, mm -hmm. and so can't find anything good to say about them. But of course you find that out in the other world, in the outside world too. Take two last questions mm -hmm. here and then here. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, how do we think about, um, have you thought about just war as it applies to, uh, is it different, uh, U.S. being the most powerful country in the world, and um, the, how does just war theory apply when we have this global situation where, um, how do we decide which 
you know, which wars to get involved with and which not to. And it's not just the countries around us anymore as mm -hmm. in the times of Aquinas. Well, it's, it's, first of all, this is our tradition. And uh, people, not me, people before me have, have commented that, that what you find in this tradition really encapsulates the way we in the West have come to think about morality and warfare when we're thinking at our, at our best. And, and so it's, it's important, I think, to, to know this, uh, tradition, know what it historically was all about, and uh, find some way to, to uh, bring it up to date in, in terms of the, the problems we face today. Now, that said, uh, I, uh, I don't think that it uh, gives you specific answers to particular political questions. I think it provides a general frame, and within that general frame, those that we entrust with political governance have to, have to operate. They have to make their own judgments, but they have to do so with certain parameters in mind. And uh, the, the truth of the matter is that when you think about those parameters, they, they too are not singular. Uh, the, uh, the President of the United States, whoever he is, or, or whoever she is, has to, has to think about the good of the American people, and that would be the first responsibility. But uh, they also have to think about the good of our allies. They have to think of the broader international community, uh, including uh, societies that are not specifically allied to us, and indeed maybe societies that, uh, that profess to hate us. Mm -hmm. They have to find some way of balancing the responsibilities to all those groups of people that, uh, with the, the fundamental responsibility that they have to our own people. That's really the, 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 the hard core of what, uh, what I think we ought to want our political leaders to do. I think also that, uh, and, and this refers to something I said earlier, when we uh, raise children and educate children, uh, we need to be uh, very serious about inculcating in, in them uh, a self-reliance about their own opinions and a willingness to speak up whatever the consequences are, uh, partly because of the social media, MSNBC, Wolf Blitzer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I find very few people uh, in either party uh, willing to uh, say exactly what they think if they think the consequences are going to get them into trouble. And one of the things I admire about that post-war generation which incidentally, to refresh your memory, Democratic administration, Republicans controlled both houses. Look what they did. Yeah, they had a few crazies at that time also, but it was a wonderful uh, example of, it seems to me, democracy at its most thoughtful and best. Um, take a look at what happened uh, in the White House on the 12th of March, 1947, in the uh, discussion among State Department people and President Truman and representatives of Congress, mainly, mainly Republicans, uh, when they made the decision to come to the aid of uh, Greece and Turkey, which led to the enunciation of the Truman Doctrine, which led directly to the Marshall Plan. You had, peop <laughs> you had people and citizens uh, very alert to what the better angels of their, their nature were, were singing and much less alert to the consequences of taking opinions that might get them into trouble. And I think uh, developing qualities of uh, character, willingness to stand up and say what you think at a very young age, uh, I think that's, a, that's an important thing. How can you disagree with that? <laughs> <laughs> and question. incidentally, uh, you, you made a comment or two about the Catholic uh, bishops. Uh, I knew some chaplains uh, in, in, uh, in Vietnam and later on. Uh, the ones I thought were the best, and it was a mixture of Catholics and Jews and Protestants and so on, were the ones who evangelized not by what they said, but by who they were. I, and I hope that is still taught in chaplain school. <laughs> Excuse me. Last question of the evening. Yeah. 
Uh, my question uh, was, is with concern with uh, genocide. So we talk about, uh, we can go back to St. Augustine, to talk about protecting vulnerable people. Uh, when we have a Srebrenica, <coughs> when we have a Rwanda, when we have a Sudan, uh, when we talk about just war, surely stopping, preventing genocide, stopping a failed state from collapsing, which invites insurgencies, the rise of insurgent groups, whether they're communists, whether they're Maoist, or now Islamist. Does the West have an obligation to move in to restore order to prevent the rise of the kind of groups that we then find ourselves fighting after the state has collapsed? Well, it would always be nice to, to preempt them. Uh, sometimes, usually, that, that turns out not to be possible for a whole variety of reasons. But I thought you were initially leading us in the direction of, of asking about the, the fate of R2P, the responsibility to protect. Uh, that, I, I thought that that was an extremely promising initiative back when it first appeared. Uh, what was it, uh, 2000, what, 2001, I guess, when the, the uh, ISIS group uh, published the responsibility to protect. Uh, it, it laid out a rationale that uh, if, if one knows anything about just war theory, one would recognize immediately as a version of that. Uh, and it, uh, it, it made some really quite extraordinary claims of what the lawyers call lex ferenda, what ought to be, what ought to be law, uh, that, uh, that would, if, if carried through, obligate the international community and individual states uh, and groups of states to, uh, to act in cases where there were uh, really egregious violations of basic human rights, and genocide would be one of those, but not the only one. Uh, this made it, uh, this was produced by, by an independent group. Uh, it made it into the UN and passed the high level panel of, of UN diplomats. It uh, featured in the report of the Secretary General. Uh, and it, uh, it, it looked very good to become something that was going to become a part of major UN policy. But there were also serious reservations among uh, <coughs> various countries out there. And in the, in the 2005 World Summit, uh, two paragraphs of the outcome document were devoted to the responsibility to protect. And they effectively rewrote what the whole idea was all about. Rephrasing this largely in terms of what the UN Charter already said about states not using force across uh, international boundaries except in self-defense and uh, leaving matters having to do with international peace and security up to the decision of the Security Council. The one thing that was left in the outcome document that was very interestingly new in the context of UN law was that was a statement, a fairly lengthy statement, that it really is the responsibility of every government to seek the good uh, for its people and to protect them from egregious humanitarian abuses. And it obligated the members of the international community to assist governments to do this. Now, the irony just leaps out at you because it's, uh, it's some of those governments that are, in fact, the problem. You know? hmm. but, but to say to them, you have this responsibility, was something that never had been done before in any kind of an international legal document. And I think that that turned out to be a, a very good thing. The outcome document of 2005 is probably as far as the international community is willing to go on this subject. And so you pretty much just have to accept that, uh, although one might wish for something more. But uh, again, remember that 
when you think about the obligations of individual states, their primary obligations are to the, the, the good of their own community. And so I don't think that there is any uh, particular obligation that says we ought to forego that in order to help the people in another community out. There was a, a statement that the, uh, that the uh, oh, I've forgotten what the term for it is, anyway, the, the National Organization of the United Presbyterian Church made, the General Convention of the United Presbyterian Church issued a statement in 1996 in the context of the, the uh, ongoing Bosnian war and with the Rwandan genocide back there only two years earlier. And it said that, uh, you know, very grudgingly in this lengthy statement with many points, about halfway down, it, uh, it admitted that, that, that uh, sometimes the United States perhaps ought to use armed force in cases of these really serious humanitarian abuses. But it said, only if there is no national interest purpose involved. And I read that and thought, my God, uh -huh. uh, what, what, what president would we want to have who ignores national interest in dealing with a problem, uh, however serious that problem is? I, I don't think that's right myself. Anything to add, General Bunting? No, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Dr. Johnson, General Bunting, thank you very much. Thank you. all for coming out. Mm -hmm. I also just want to thank Paul Miller and the Clement Center. We're always delighted to partner with the, the Clement Center. They've been a great partner. If you have friends who would want to see tonight's event and can't be here, it will be up on the Trinity Forum's website within the next couple of days by the end of the week for sure. Uh, you can also see photos, see comments and the like on our Facebook page uh, or on Twitter. Go on Facebook, tag your friends on the photos and the like. It will be, we'd appreciate it. Uh, all of you should have on your chair an invitation, which looks like this, to join the Trinity Forum Society. We hope that all of you will avail yourself of this invitation tonight. Uh, there are special incentives to do so. A part of what we do at the Forum is provide quarterly readings, uh, such as this, which take a classic or contemporary work of literature or letters that we think would be quite valuable to leaders in helping them live and lead wisely and well and essentially tenderloin it, take the most important excerpts, provide an introduction explaining why it's valuable and the like, as well as different programs like this one tonight. Um, so we hope that you'll do that. As a special incentive, if you do join tonight, you can have the reading of your choice. Um, simply see my colleague Margaret Eberly, who will wave her hand, uh, who can answer any questions or sign you up uh, for that. In addition, our next event with the Clement Center, as Paul mentioned, is going to be May 6th, at the Army Navy Club, we'll be hearing from Walter Russell Mead on religion and the foundations of geopolitical order. And our next event, uh, which is not with the Clement Center, but just a Trinity Forum event, will actually be just one room over uh, in the gala room of the National Press Club on April 20th. And we'll be hearing from New York Times columnist David Brooks on his new book, The Road to Character with a response by Mike Gerson. So mark your calendars now. We hope we'll see you on April 20th, as well as on May 6th. Finally, I think it's always appropriate to end with thanks, and certainly there's many people to thank. We really appreciate the uh, very interesting comments by our speakers this evening, as well as our partners, and I'd also just like to give a shout out to my fantastic colleagues, Margaret Everly, Chloe Cuffel, and intern Stuart Spooner, and Nathan Tolles. So appreciate all that you do. Finally, thank you to each of you for coming out on this uh, cold and soggy night. Thank you. The bar will reopen, and good night. <laughs>